Hey guys, this is John. Just a quick heads up before we start today's Climbing the Rating Ladder video. We are currently running a Black Friday sale on Chessable. For those who don't know or maybe new to my channel, I am the co-founder of Chessable and this site is very near and dear to me. Many of you are users. I really, really appreciate you guys as does the entire Chessable team. So we're running a massive Black Friday sale. It lasts from November 20th, so a few days ago as of the recording of this video, all the way to December 1st, so after Thanksgiving. And you have plenty of time to take advantage of these deals. We're kind of running these course sales in two-day increments, so every 48 hours, a new batch of courses comes up for sale. And there are more than 230 courses that you can get at a significant discount right now. So if you've had your eye on something, you're kind of waiting for the right time to buy, I suggest taking advantage now. You can see a number of the lifetime repertoires are currently on sale, and also the Iron English Bofinic Variation by Grandmaster Simon Williams and I am Richard Palliser. I mentioned this one because it's a relatively new release and it's got a ton of great feedback. I won't go through all these titles, but yeah, suffice it to say, <laughs> virtually the entire site, I think, has some sort of deal going. So don't quote me on that, but 230 courses is a lot of courses. So just wanted to let you know, because I know many of you are Chessable users or are maybe thinking about trying Chessable. And we do have a ton of free courses, I want to say as well. So if you uh, don't want to spend any money or maybe can't afford to, totally fine. Do go take a look at our free courses as well, especially the short and sweets for openings. All right, thanks guys. Let's jump into the action in today's Climbing the Rating Ladder video. Okay, I'm playing BMH449 in a 5 plus 5 game. Let's go. Let's see what my opponent has in store for me. I met Knight F3 with D5, and now we're transposing into D4, D5 territory. Let's see if white goes for C4. No, white plays Bishop F5. I'll play, or Bishop F4, rather. I will play C5 in reply, looking to attack the center. And let's play Queen B6 here. So holding the pawn on C5, also hitting B2. Tough opponent here, 1801. Taking on d4 was also fine on the last move. That would be in the style of the exchange Slav, but I'm going to try to keep a little bit more tension. Let's play knight c6. Now, white's queen on c2 may run into alignment issues. I can look to play bishop f5 here, idea being queen takes f5, queen takes b2, and the rook on a1 is hanging and will be lost. So... The only thing I'm wondering is if I play this move, white inserts this capture here if I have anything to worry about there. Because then queen takes c5, white could play queen takes f5. So I could also play the intermediate capture in this position, but I prefer to keep the tension if I can, because I want to keep this for later. But let me just think for a moment. So if I play bishop f5, d takes c5, bishop takes c2, white can capture on b6 somehow feels like white is doing a little bit better there. So you know what? I'm just going to play g6 and look to play bishop f5 coming up when that square is really well protected. If white plays bishop d3 here, I'll play c4 and then go bishop f5. Hope you all are having a great week. It's been a productive one for me. Staying busy. All right, let's go ahead and play bishop f5 as planned. And, okay, queen c1, defends the pawn here. Now, let's, let's play rook c8. Line up with the queen. I'm just curious how white's going to react to that. I'm very likely going to complete my development soon. Bishop g7 and castles. But, let's put the rook on c8 and probe. White did take, so I'm happy with this development. The fact that white gave up this kind of figurehead pawn on d4. We're both a couple moves away from castling here, but the position is relatively closed, so you can get away with that when there are no obviously open lines. Now here, one idea I may have, guys, is knight b4. So looking to come into c2, but white plays knight b3 hitting my queen. Let's just back off. I had this fairly lengthy think on move 6. Yeah, 49 seconds there before playing g6, but... I think it has paid off. My position looks pretty good here. Okay, knight d4. 
I definitely don't want to allow knight takes f5, so I think it's a matter of should I capture here or just retreat my bishop. I'm going to retreat my bishop because white may have this superfluous knight issue going on where uh, the meaning of that is the knight on b3 is competing for the other knight square on d4. So this knight is not too happy. The knight on d4 occupies a decent post, but it's unclear what this piece is doing. Okay, bishop g3, that's kind of odd. I don't really like that move for white. It seemed unnecessary. Maybe they're worried about knight h5, but I can attack the bishop in other ways, like knight e4. Let's play bishop h6 here. Line up with this white queen. So still kind of stalking the queen whenever possible. She's starting to get uncomfortable here, opposite the bishop and opposite the rook. I had to switch from the blonde roast at Starbucks to the normal uh, pike roast, which is like their, their default blend. Because the blonde roast had too much caffeine. <laughs> Trying to cut back slightly, guys. But uh, the caffeine is very much fueling my video making, oftentimes. Okay, and queen b1. Now, do I actually play knight h5? Maybe white can go here. Might not be anything. Let's just castle. I'm a little behind the clock, so... Just get my king to safety. I think bishop d3 or bishop e2 is fairly likely. White has to think about castling here. White does play bishop d3. Now e5 is pretty tempting, but if I make that pawn advance, white can meet it with knight takes c6, and then bishop takes e5 is coming. So I'm actually thinking I might want to play a5. Bishop takes g6 is not a threat. I've got that on lockdown. So yeah, let's play a5 and, and try to attack this superfluous knight on b3. I've mentioned this before, but knights that stand on b3, b6, and also g3 and g6, they're especially susceptible to a rook pawn push. So that's a motif you should drill into your head. Okay, and white's going to allow that pawn to reach a4, so I will happily play that. And on knight d2, how will I continue? White has to play knight d2 or knight takes c6 here. White does play knight d2. e5 still runs into knight takes c6, followed by bishop takes e5. But I'm happy with this pawn being down here. It has kind of a cramping effect on the position. Maybe rook here. Just looking to play e5, although I guess white can play knight, e4, knight f3, looking to get into e5. Okay, another move I'm considering here is taking on d4 because e takes d4 runs into bishop takes d2 so white would have to take with a c pawn yeah might be a decent time to do that and something like bishop e5 maybe let's try that yeah bishop b5 let's get rid of white's bishop I do worry that this bishop may be a little out of the game now, but I'm making some strides. Knight f3, let's say knight e4. Okay, white captures, I'll take back. Queen is still uncomfortable on b1 because I own the c-file, and now she has to stay guarding the pawn. Okay, rook c1. Hmm. I'm looking at infiltrations like queen e2. Uh, again, kind of the missing piece to the puzzle seems to be this bishop. It doesn't have as much freedom as, as I would like. The knight, mm, I could send it to h5, but it seems too early. I want that knight to be able to go to e4 if white ever moves this. So, yeah, queen e2 is my top candidate move right now. Don't really want to initiate the trade because then white gets the file, and I can't easily play rook c8 after that. Queen b4 is maybe something I should consider, too. I'm going to go with queen e2, though. Looks more promising. A little more aggressive. Maybe white will panic and play something suboptimal here. You never know. But I think this is just a pretty good move, period. Okay, so knight f3. And now I can make use of this square if I want. Seems timely. Also, there's bishop takes e3 ideas, but they're not going to work yet. 
Yeah, let's go with knight e4. So I have a grip on the position. There's no immediate tactics here, but I have a nice grip. Mainly because of the C-file control, guys. That's controlling the landscape right now, too. Okay, rook e1, trying to boot the queen. Could go back to b5. I could also play queen c2. Queen c2 somehow seems like I'm letting white off a little easy. So let's go here. I just think it's so tough for white to do much with this queen. Maybe white will play queen d1. Queen takes b2, queen takes a4, but I don't necessarily have to take the pawn on b2. I can always capture this bishop on g3. I'm sort of holding that bishop hostage. I might play f6. And by the way, if my thought process sounds a lot more stream of consciousness than you're used to in this series, this is kind of what happens when you're playing better and better players. You know, I, um, I have to adjust a little bit more on the fly. They're playing stronger moves. They're coming up with better ideas. Okay, knight e5. Now here, I think I can win a pawn, knight d2, queen d1, queen takes b2, or queen d3, queen takes b2, but it looks, looks a little too early to do that. I'm going to play f6, I think. Yeah, I don't want to run into second rank issues when I go after that pawn. Now if white plays knight d3, knight d2 is probably good. Okay, because knight d2, queen d1, queen takes d3. White actually has rook e2 there. And miraculously... Ah, but I have rook c2. Okay. So yeah, I think this will win a piece. Look for a moment like white might be able to pin me up there. And it will still be slightly awkward, but yeah, queen takes d3. So rook e2, rook c2. Just seeing if there's anything else I should consider here. Probably not. Let's bring the rook in. So I can't move this knight for fear of losing my queen, unless I can get some knight f3 shot in, but I think it's going to be enough. I would play f4 if I were white here to at least threaten bishop e1. Ah, but actually, <laughs> I am threatening knight f3 now. I was not on the previous move, but now I'm threatening knight f3 because I have a double attack on the rook on e2. That's important. So that means white has to play something like king h1 here, or rook back to e1, neither of which look great. Yeah, and I think white sees this, or maybe not. <laughs> Just as I thought they might be considering the ramifications of this knight f3 move. So yeah, knight f3 should just win a rook here. Just double checking, you never know. Could also throw in this move first, but hey, a rook's a rook. Let's go after it. Well, there is king f1 here. King f1 was possible, but I could get the queens off. Actually, if I get the queens off, my knight might be trapped. That, that's funny. King f1 was definitely the best move there. Okay, now I'm just going to take this and then take e2. I don't think king f1 was altering the assessment of the position at all, but white did have that option. Yeah, I could always swap everything on e2 and play knight g5 if I absolutely had to. Okay, so we'll see if white plays this out, but totally winning position for me. Let's take this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just capture. Bring up the king and defend this pawn. Bishop d6, I'll play rook e8. It'll be awkward for a few moves, but the material is always going to tell in this situation. Just got to be solid. Being tactically sound benefits you enormously in every aspect of chess. I want to, I can never say that enough, guys. If you are a tactically sound player, there is very little that will hurt you in this game. If you are capable of playing safe, sound moves consistently, you will go very far in chess. Okay, e4. 
Hmm. Let's take. I'm going to go here. I'm expecting d5. I think white's going to try this and this. But maybe then I play rook a6, followed by bishop d6, and, and put a stop to everything white has in mind. I can't play bishop d6 right now because of takes, and there is a pin. So this looks like a pretty good plan, though. The bishop finally gets back in the game. <laughs> it was largely a spectator, but finally it's back in the game. Next, I can play rook b8 if I want, assuming white plays something like bishop e3. That'll get the rooks off the board, pair of rooks. Mm. So white plays that one, and here I might go rook a4, attacking the loose bishop and the loose pawn behind it. Yeah. Not much to do here for white. Moving the bishop drops the e4 pawn. Just a matter of time at this point. But I'm not going to lose focus. You always have to play the game to its natural conclusion. Don't relax. I've seen people lose plenty of games, half points, because they relax too early. They assume a position's winning. There is always the chance of stalemate in chess. I am definitely not in the camp that... You know, I saw a video by Danny Wrench a while back advocating for... Um, potentially getting rid of the stalemate rule instead of all the variants in chess. He likes no stalemate the best. But I I vehemently disagree. I think stalemate is uh, an excellent concept. If we got rid of stalemate, it would completely change all endgame theory. Check now picks up the bishop. All right. So thank you to BMH for the game. I select these players randomly, by the way, if you're ever curious. I literally just go to the seat graph, so open challenges here, and I kind of look for uh, an opponent and a time control that seems interesting. Again, this is an educational series, climbing the rating ladder. I'm not trying to flex on my opponents. This is meant to provide instruction for those of you who are at these rating levels, or lower especially, or even higher. I think there's things to be gleaned, and trying to show you how I approach uh, these games and helpful tips for you along the way in your own rating journey. Your development in chess. So if I were to characterize this game, I would say the file control towards the end was the major factor. So that, that was sort of the, the major storyline starting right about here that led to the pressure and then white eventually losing a piece. Earlier, I would say the capture white made on c5 allowed for a, a pretty comfortable position on my end. So We'll take a look at the theory here. This is a, a London system, and that's been quite a popular system. I even co-authored a course on the London for white on Chessable. But yeah, if I were to critique a decision that white made, I think it's this D takes C5 move. That being said, I can see why white played this, because with the rook lined up against the queen, moves like C takes D4 followed by knight B4 are in the air. Maybe white can think about knight H4 in this position going after the bishop. But after captures on c5, I definitely like my position. And remember this superfluous knight concept, by the way. I'm not taking here, because if I take, if I make that automatic capture, yeah, it opens the c file, but after knight takes d4, that knight has employment. And I want to keep this knight on b3 unemployed. So what else can I say before clicking over to the analysis? We'll take a quick peek with the engine. I think, although white was worse, probably right around here, they have to be pretty careful. And maybe they can equalize or get close to it if they're careful. Okay, knight f3, knight e4. Yeah, so this was the, the game losing blunder, it seems to me, when white played knight d3, because then I had knight d2. I was picking up the knight, and <laughs> I was seeing a couple ghosts here, but it does look like the pieces pretty much secure at that point. So I would question knight e5. I mean, after f6, white could bring the knight back to f3 or play maybe knight g4. Knight looks pretty awkward there. After this, 
it doesn't have anywhere to go safely, so I would be threatening h5. But let's say right here, if I were in white's shoes, I think I would try queen, queen d1. Because white has to solve the issue of the queen being on b1, blocking in the rook on a1. If they don't solve that issue, they're just going to be worse forever, and it'll probably have material consequences at some point. But here, if I take on b2, which is why white had their queen on b1 in the first place, then queen takes a4 is possible, and all of a sudden white's position looks reasonable, totally reasonable, I would say. Unless there's a tactic here, but I'm not seeing it. So that's a tough move, queen d1, kind of a counterattacking move. And if that had been played, I might try to probe further on the queen side. I'd love to double up my rooks on the c file. That would be great. I mean, if I could get my rook into c2 and the other rook coming over to c8, that would be awesome. But if I play something like rook c6, now knight e5 makes a lot more sense hitting the rook. So knowing myself, I might play something like f6 here to take this away and possibly prepare rook c6. But say white plays queen e2 at this moment, offering a trade of queens and guarding b2. Well, take, take, rook c6. I still own the c-file, but white's coordinated, at least now. Maybe they can kind of huddle up, like rook d1, let's say. I bring my rook over, maybe king f1. The rook may get into c2. Definitely pressure, but this is far better than what white had in the game. Yeah, maybe knight e1 or something here. 100% uh, take. I'm taking black in this position, but there were ways for white to try to squirm out of this. Okay, so let's run the engine real quick. We always want to do a little analysis, a little digging on our own before we run the engine. Important to have those conclusions already sort of drawn that you can modify based on what the engine says. Uh, one thing I like to do is take a look at the opening explorer. So c3 actually isn't that common here. Most players play e3. Uh, I've gone over this in other videos, but if white plays d takes c5, you don't have to worry. You can think of this as kind of like a reverse queen's gambit. So uh, black can play e6, attacking the pawn on c5. And if white gets greedy trying to defend, those pawns are going to get undermined real quick. You don't really want to get into this situation. You can see the stats here for black. Knight c6 further undermining. The crux of the issue here for white is that it's very hard to play c3 and a3 when the rook on a1 is undefended. This black can take, and after knight takes b4, white can't recapture for fear of losing their rook. So the queen queen side structure falls apart for white. So you don't have to worry about d takes c5 in this particular situation. There are a couple lines where you do, but in general, black will have avenues for counterplay or means of getting the pawn back. So white played c3. Yeah, and c takes d4 would go into an exchange slav directly, but I wanted to keep the tension. I played queen b6. Again, you can see overall, black scores pretty well in this line. So hitting that pawn, queen c2. Now, do not make the mistake. I didn't mention this in the game, but I actually did this in a, a game I recall on, I think, ICC. Don't make the mistake of playing bishop f5 here. <laughs> Looking for queen takes f5, queen takes b2, this tactic I mentioned, albeit in a, a slightly different position, because you will get mated on c8 if you're not guarding that square with your rook. Tragic. So that's an elegant way to lose the game. <laughs> so I played knight c6 instead. Yeah, e3. Okay, and here I wasn't exactly sure what to do. I, I'm pretty sure I've looked at this position in the past, but uh, good to see that the move I played, g6, actually is the top move here. So yeah, on bishop f5, even though this works out fine for black, because now c8 is guarded and I will win that rook, I just wasn't liking d takes c5. White can throw that move in. And I mentioned this line in the game. I'm just not thrilled to play this. Yeah, white has the bishop pair here. Black has double isolated pawns. Not the best. So g6, knight bd2. Now bishop f5. Also bishop g7 gets played a lot. They're almost neck and neck. Okay. White plays d takes c5 sometimes here. That does make sense. I wonder if the idea is d takes c5, queen takes c5, queen b3. Uh-huh. Trying to pop the queen back out, attacking this. Got it. Okay. And there's some games here. 
that that does look like a better option for white because that queen was a, a constant issue for white in this game as we've already established now i haven't clicked the engine on yet we're still in the opening book i'm going to click it on now though because we're getting towards the end of the opening book and the engine might be useful yeah engine definitely prefers d takes c5 here so after queen c1 rook c8 looks like black has a, a tiny pull there's this trade okay yeah i was sort of criticizing this decision by white but again i can see why they made it when that rook hits c8 it's not simple for white to solve these problems because let's say white goes bishop e2 i mean i always have this option take Let's say e pawn takes knight b4. And it looks a little scary for white with knight c2 or knight d3 coming. Maybe it's nothing, but it looks scary. So my opponent took on c5. This is great. My fan isn't going hardly at all right now. <laughs> so that's promising. All right. And now, yeah, knight, knight f to d4. Hmm. If I were playing white, I'd really want to get my bishop out in castle ASAP. But the engine doesn't mind this move. So if this is played, I can still think about this, but maybe then knight d4, there's knight d3 check. Hmm. Here. Yeah, I wouldn't mind playing this position for sure. Because here I'd be stopping white from castling. Okay, so maybe knight fd4 is helpful then. And I pulled the bishop back. Again, I don't want this, where this knight suddenly is participating, not just sitting on b3, hoping it can get to d4. This, this too also looks pretty good for black, though. Okay, so I dropped back. Yeah, and, and this bishop g3, I really didn't see the point of for white. I assume it's because white doesn't want to allow the bishop to get hit with knight h5, but I don't think white can afford to do this here. I don't think I punished it exactly in the game, but I think if you're white in this position, you just got to move your bishop and castle. You're two moves away from castling. You're going to have to do that soon, so you might as well play it right now. The engine wants me to go knight e4 here. Yeah, nice active move. I like this bishop h6 idea, though, lining up with the queen. And another queen move by white. Not really threatening anything on this diagonal, because, again, white can always take back with the, with the knight. So, again, maybe moving something like bishop d3, bishop e2 is, is best here. So queen b1 I would question as well. All right. And here I went, went ahead and played a5. I mentioned rook f8 in the game, too. But maybe not in this position. Yeah, I think I mentioned rook f e8 when white had re retreated this knight to d2 and might be in a better position to stop me from playing e5. But yeah, rook f e8 looks pretty good here. But a5 is up there as well on the eval. Knight h5 as well. Okay, so I continued... Yeah, still wants me to go knight h5 in a lot of instances here. Yeah, now if I play rook f8, I wasn't liking this knight 2 to f3 situation where e5 can be met by this, and that pawn on e5 is hanging. So I think if I was going to go for this, looking for e5, I should have done it when the knight was sitting on b3. Again, if I had done it too early, so let's say e5 right here, I run into knight takes c6, followed by bishop takes e5. The computer even thinks this position's good for black, though. C5. The queen defense. Good compensation, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so I think I could have played that a little bit better. About a half pawn advantage here for black, though. Bishop B5, I like this because this bishop is probably white's best minor piece. It's lined up with the queen. They're creating this battery. And most importantly, it's guarding the E4 square which is a square I had an eye on with my knight for the rest of the game. And it defends c2, so if I eventually want to use this file, getting rid of that bishop is helpful. 
So take, take, okay. Yeah, it's just this nagging, this persistent advantage for black. Still in like the half pawn territory, but that could easily rise from here. Rook c1, yep, queen e2. Knight f3, computer recommends knight f1 instead, but looks kind of similar. And I jump the knight in. Rook e1, okay. And here's where I mentioned queen d1. And it looks like the computer agrees. All these moves are worse for white, but queen d1, at least for now, is the top move. Trying to coordinate. White has to get that queen off of b1. Otherwise, that rook on a1 is never joining. It's just too, too passive of a construction there. Okay, and f6, I think I mentioned that too. Maybe looking to double. So it would have been interesting if white had played that. Instead, knight e5. Now I get to play f6. Useful move. And yeah, knight d3 is the decisive mistake. White must play something like knight g4 or knight back to f3. Uh, queen d3 is clever. I didn't see that move in the game. So if queen takes, then the knight comes back safely. But I can take here too. And black is still in the driver's seat. So knight d2 and yeah, queen d1 is the only safe move for the queen. I pick up the knight. Rook e2, rook c2. And just no good way for white to pick up that knight, really. And I was mentioning something like f4 followed by bishop e1. That might be a way for white to try this, but they're running into knight f3 check and taking the rook. Again, white could try king, king f2 here, but I guess this is winning for black without too many troubles. And as played after b3, oh wow, rook takes a2. Huh. Yeah, I, I did stop for a second to consider if I should play something like a takes b3, something a little more patient here than the immediate knight f3. Rook takes a2 is really nice. Idea there, guys, is if rook takes a2, now the queen is undefended, and knight f3 is even stronger. Pick up the queen and just devastation here. But yeah, in a position like this where you're up a piece, you're not going to want to complicate things too much. And I was getting a little bit lower on the clock, so I'm happy with this. And if king h1 is played, I'm just curious what the engine thinks I should do here. Aha, uh -huh, rook d2. Squeeze white further. White can't stay guarding the rook. They don't have e1 available. Yeah, that's a nice move. Rook takes d2 is illegal. Totally winning. Yeah. And the rest of the game was just a cleanup job. Um, don't worry so much about winning fast here. The main thing is to play good, tactically sound chess not let your opponent back in the game unnecessarily, right? So I was being aware of my opponent's counterplay, d5. White does have this idea of d6. So what did I play? Rook a6. I don't really even care if it's not in the top three moves here. Every normal move is winning for black. And I like the one I played. It shut, shuts down white's play. I bring the bishop back and white has nothing here. And I won further material. If white had played bishop e3, I could play f5, uh, I could play rook b8, it's probably the move I would play, I was mentioning this one, trying to get the rooks off the board, if rook d7 there's king e8, so just continuing to play meticulous sound chess. And if that sounds boring to you, I'm sorry, uh, my style is very much like the takeaway counterplay from the opponent's style, it's worked for me throughout my career, I do like to mix it up too, I, I calculate pretty well when I want to, but I prefer this kind of grind them down style where I feel like I have control in the position. So, but that may not be your style. That's the nice thing about chess. There's a style out there for everyone and you don't even have to peg yourself to a certain style. You can always change it up and play positions that maybe are not exactly your cup of tea or so you thought you might evolve over time. Okay, so thanks again to BMH449 for the game. File control was a big, big theme in that one. Uh, once again, if you're a Chessable user or are interested in checking out the site, do take advantage of our Black Friday sale going on. It's been running from November 20th, and it will go to December 1st. I'm just looking at my notes here. And there are over 230 courses on sale, so a massive amount of courses. There's a very good chance that if you've had your eye on a course, you're waiting for a sale maybe to pick it up, now is the time to, to jump on that. So do go take a look.
several of my courses are on sale as well. And you can find those linked down below in the description. So thanks again, guys. And I'll be back again soon with another video.